Thank you. So I'm going to talk about some joint work with my student, Matthew Dawes, and it's very much work in progress. Um, so I'm going to say all sorts of things which are approximate or uh, probably flat out wrong, and they will then be preserved by this machine and be on YouTube for the rest of history. So um, you shouldn't take anything I say too seriously. Um, I mean, I'm willing to stick my neck out, but I don't see any reason why I should stick his neck out as well. Um, and um, so I'm going to start off with some, some background, because I think this is just talk about... Um, Hyperkähler manifolds, compact hyperkähler manifolds, for a few minutes. This is very well known indeed to, um, to some people in the room. You can go to sleep for a bit. Um, uh, but um, it wouldn't do any harm to, uh, to just to write down the, um, the definition. So um, OK, so I'll say that um, um, definition, I'll say that x is an irreducible hyperkähler um, holomorphic symplectic manifold manifold if um, it's... Um, Simply connected complex manifold with an everywhere non degenerate two form. Sigma, and that should be the whole of H20. Okay. Um, so the first thing you should think of is a K3 surface, and then the second thing you think of is um, Hilbert schemes of points on K3 surfaces, and then you start thinking of other things, and then you stop after a while. Um, OK, um, in this situation, um, H2, the integral second cohomology, um, carries a, um, a quadratic form, non-degenerate, quadratic form, Qx. And this is called the um, Bouvier Bogomolov Fujiki form, or some sub collection of those people, depending which of them happen to be in the audience. But this is being recorded for the universe, so they're all in the audience potentially, so I better write out all the names. Um, so this is of signature three something. And in general, it's, um, it certainly isn't unimodular in general. It isn't actually known to be, even, to be an even form in general, but it is in all the examples we actually know. Bet it is, though. But. Um, OK, so what we're going to do is to use this as a substitute for the um, intersection form in the middle cohomology. We're going to, use, we're going to try to understand the moduli um, of, um, of these objects by thinking about 
the period domain associated with this, um, with this quadratic form or some related quadratic forms. Um, so what you would like to have would be a Torelli theorem. And um, so there is now um, a global Torelli theorem. to Verbitsky, um, which does not say either the first thing you would think of or the second thing you would think of. Um, so, um, and I'm not really going to use this. Um, so we've got more information than I'm I'm really taking advantage of. Um, but even without it, I do have um, a relation between a period domain associated with this quadratic form um, and moduli of, um, of, of the, uh, at least in the projective case, at least. Um, moduli of um, irreducible hypercalar manifolds, which is fairly well known. Um, so I'll write down a, I'll write down a statement, fairly, fairly shortly. Um, but even let's just say rather vaguely, we, even without it, we can describe moduli um, in terms of periods, but with some ambiguities. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, and so I'm interested in moduli of um, polarized, and therefore in particular projective, hypercalar manifolds. And so there are just some general facts that give us some chance the, of doing this. Um, so um, the first thing is that you do at least have a local Torelli theorem. And that was proved by Beauville. And then the um, period map is subjective. And this time I certainly have to write the, na the name up because we don't need the internet to reach the, the person concerned. And then the other thing is that the deformations unobstructed. So the situation is not so bad, really. Um, OK. So I'm going to write up the list, which is, again, well known to most people, but let's have it written up, of the hypercalar manifolds we know about. Four of them. Okay. 
Um, okay. So the known the known examples are. Um, Deformations of um, Hilbert's scheme of endpoints on a K3 surface. And I think most of the um, effort has gone into this case. And whenever we've come across, we saw this in the last talk, whenever we've come across compact, um, compact hyperkähler manifolds, um, in nature, so to speak. I think they've nearly always turned out to be of this kind. And I don't really know whether there's any reason for that um, or whether it's just that that's because of we've been thinking about K3 surfaces and things related to K3 surfaces to start with. Um, then um, related to that, there is um, um, there's another moduli space of sheaves on K3 surface found by O'Grady, which um, has this property, which I'm going to say nothing about. Um, and then, well, perhaps almost nothing about. Then there are deformations of, I should be saying deformations of all over the place, Deformations of generalized commas. So what I do is I take an abelian surface A and I look at the Hilbert scheme of length n plus 1 on K and then there's an addition map that goes, to, goes back to A. And I take the fiber over zero of that. Okay, and then these things have some deformations, and then there's a a fourth one, which is O'Grady again. Um, and again, this is starting with abelian surfaces. So I've written these with. So there are two that are related to K3s, and there are two that are related to abelian surfaces. Um, and I'm going to write over here the um, so I've told you that there's this um, bobil bogomola fujiki form on H2. I'm going to just write the abstractly what the lat what that lattice is for each of these so this one is um, three copies of the hyperbolic plane and then um, two copies of e8 negative definite and then a minus to n um, this one I'll, I'll write this one actually because it's, this is 2e8 minus 1, and then there's a minus 2n and a minus 2. Minus 2n plus 2, thank you. Uh, sorry, that's right, yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, you're right, it should. It should. I'm thinking of the, the I'm thinking of the one that goes here. Um, let me just remove that because I don't need it. <laughs> I told you I was going to write false things on the board. I wasn't intending to write that one though. Thank you. Um, um, but this one um, is the one I'm really wanting to talk about today, um, and this one is just. Um, um, I even had a note to myself not to to do that actually. Um, and then, so this one um, it gives me um, just um, um, three copies of U 
and then um, the same the same thing minus um, two n plus one, and this is for n greater than or equal to two, of course. Okay, so. Um, Some effort has been spent on the moduli spaces of on the moduli space of this one, and there's a paper by um, uh, Hulek Gretzenko and myself on this one, which um, I think it's fair to say nobody has paid very much attention to, which is probably correct. Um, so it just does, goes somewhere and then stops. Um, but um, this, but the other two really haven't attracted so much attention, and I suppose that's partly because we don't run into these objects quite so much. I mean, actually, I see, even, um, even with this first one, the one that we worked with, that we and other people have worked on, I'll say a bit more about this in a few minutes, um, is um, a particular type of polarization that you have on those, um, um, on the, on those varieties. But in actual fact, the ones, when we write things, when we actually come across examples in nature, um, they seem to have the, um, the other kind of polarization. So maybe we haven't really looked at the moduli spaces of the things we do see. Let's say a bit more about that in a minute. Okay. What was I going to say next? Okay. So... Um, So um, we, and that means um, studied um, polarized moduli. For cases one and two, and then there's a lot more detail, um, um, and then by well various people, but Markman in particular, and there's really not very much for the other two. So I think really what I'm trying to um, say in this talk is that. Um, Perhaps it is worth paying some attention to the other two, at least to the um, deformations of generalized commerce. Okay. So, um, well, I mean, yes, in the sense that the, 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 the they exist. Uh, n uh, no, I do not know any, as I say, whenever we come across these things in nature, they seem to be. So far, they've always seen to be deformations of K3N. But also, it, not only that, but when we do come across them in nature, if they come with a polarization, which they usually do, it tends to be a non-split polarization, which is not the one that we've studied, although people are thinking about that one. So, um, yes, so I suppose you could argue that if these things don't occur in nature, then I'm not so interested in the moduli space. But... Um, it seems to me there's something not done here. Um, but yes, I mean, that's a good question. Um, do we even know an example as opposed to the mere existence? We know there are non-trivial deformations of generalized commas because we can compute the, the deformation space. Um, but I don't think we were saying this earlier. We don't think we've ever seen uh, we don't think we've ever actually seen an example. So if anybody knows otherwise, I'd be, I'd be glad to know. Um, the other thing is, I mean, in this case, we've looked mostly at first, we've looked at this for some small a and n equals 2, and then there are some, well, you wrote up an example in the last lecture, you wrote up an example, I think, probably with n equals 4. Um, so there's still, you no, know, there's lots of these things we've not really, not really seen yet. Um, okay, so let me... Um, just write down a bit of detail about how these, not too much detail about how these moduli spaces actually work. 
So, so this is all old, um, and um, so. Polarization is um, a class H of an ample line bundle. And of course, because I said simply connected, I don't mind if you confuse the line bundle with its, with its class. Um, in Um, and um, so you should note that this thing has positive square under the, well, I say note. I think one has to think about it for a moment. Um, it has positive square in the, um, uh, in, in the Bovial form. The converse is false. Just because this is positive, it doesn't mean that it's the class of an ample line bundle. Um, but um, generically, that is the case. Um, and what is true is that if you have an H with positive square, then there is a polarization. You are at least dealing with projective, projective objects. I think this is all Daniel. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to fix the... Um, the lattice L, so I'm, I mean, I'm just, this is a, um, the things I've written up there, this is an abstract lattice with that form on it. And then um, I'm going to do, th I'm, and um, um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look, well, for local purposes, I'm going to look at, um, Well, I'll choose an H in L now. Um, and this was this was in the um, in H two, but this is a in the abstract lattice for the moment. Um, with H squared positive, so this is the abstract version of what I've got here. And then I want to um, to write down. Um, LH is the orthogonal complement of H in L. Um, so this is a sublattice of L. And then, so this gives a period domain. How am I doing? Omega LH. And because this is now signature to something, um, this splits into a DLH and another bit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, get a map from, uh, well, what I need to do is I need to look at marked um, manifolds. So I need to fix an isomorphism from H2XZ to L. And then that gives me a period map, which just says, inside H2XZ, I have that distinguished um, two form. And where does the isomorphism take it? And it'll take it to, and the, the, of course, the two form is distinguished only up to a scalar, but that doesn't matter because the period domain um, is the projectivization of um, a, certain part, or a certain part of the projectivization of this uh, so, um, so let me write that down. Actually, this is the um, this is the set of W in the projectivization of L H tends C with, um, and then I want um, W squared positive. Sorry, W squared zero and W W bar is positive. Um, and then, um, um, and then a choice 
of marking, I'm being a bit imprecise here, um, it's fairly standard stuff. A marking is a map site isomorphism from, and I want it to go from H2, Xz, to L. Uh, that gives a period map which takes X to um, the class of um, psi of sigma. Okay. Right. So this is the thing I'm really interested in. And then... Um, what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to divide out, we're going to land in one of these components. So I've just put the dash on the one we don't land in. It doesn't matter. You just make some choice. And then we're going to have to divide out by, well, some orthogonal group. Um, so your first thought is the orthogonal group of this here, but then we want to preserve H. And then we're not interested in all the possible transformations either because um, the orthogonal group is just an abstract group of, of orthogonal transformations. But what we're actually interested in is moduli. We're interested in the um, representations of, uh, the, 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 um, of the things we get from monodromy in the moduli space. So you start somewhere in the moduli space, you go, and you, you, you go around in some loop. And you come back and you perform some orthogonal transformation on the cohomology. And it's possible that, that maybe not every orthogonal, not every element of the orthogonal group actually arises that way. So we're going to get some subgroup. Um, so let me write down um, a, um, a theorem, um, which is possibly the only theorem that I'm going to write down, um, but unfortunately isn't new. Um, So to do this, I need a little bit of notation. Um, so um, OK, so I'll um, look at the discriminant group of L. So it's L dual modulo L. Um, so that's a finite um, abelian group. And it comes with a quadratic form on it with values in Q mod Z. Q mod 2Z, if the form is even. Okay. So it makes sense to talk about the orthogonal group of DL, which is some finite group. And um, then there's a map from the orthogonal group of L to the orthogonal group of DL. And I get a look at the kernel of that. So that's called O tilde of L is the kernel of map from O of L to O DL. And um, and then I want um, O tilde L H is the stabilizer in O tilde of L of the element H. OK. OK, and then, so then the theorem, um, so this is still all just background. Um, so the theorem is that um, if we fix the Bermuda Bogomola Fujiki form um, and um, some other data which we probably don't need to fix, but anyway, um, for practical purposes, this is the important thing to fix. Um, 
and we also fix the dimension of x, which is even, um, then there is a quasi-projective coarse moduli space. Um, parameterizing um, oh, I should really take H primitive yeah. okay. um, <coughs> par parameterizing um, primitively polarized hyperkähler manifolds of that type. Okay, so that's not really a surprise. This is basically the general results of Vivek and so on about existence of, of uh, polarized moduli. Um, the point is that what, what do we know about this moduli space? We don't know exactly what it is because we don't have a global Torelli theorem or the global Torelli theorem that we do have doesn't actually an quite answer that question. Um, but um, um, I need also to fix the degree um, of degree d, which is h squared. Okay. And each um, irreducible component of the moduli space comes with a map. So I'll call this MD, and it maps to DLH modulo, um, and then I'll put OLH here for the moment, although I think we can do better than that. Um, and this is for some H. Um, with h squared equals d. So, and then this map is, um, it's a dominant morphism. Everything here is a quasi-projective variety, and it's finite, actually. Um, uh, it's actually a finite type, locally finite type onto its image. So, in other words, there could be lots of components um, but um, there's not um, there's, there's nothing really unpleasant going on. We're not losing masses of information. Okay, so this is um, uh, dominant and locally finite type. Oh, so about the. Uh, I think we expect it to be, well, certainly there definitely can be several components. There are examples where there are several components. Um, I think we probably, and um, I think that's the best. I don't think we know it's going to be. I don't think we know even now that there aren't some, that there can't be some, some branching. Some, I mean, I didn't sort of maybe it all covers, but um, the um, I mean, certainly there can be several components. Um, even if I fix some more, some more obvious things, there can be several components. Uh, so I think in you know I have a feeling that that isn't, but um, I. I think I don't. Act, I think I don't absolutely know. Okay. Um, so the thing I wanted to say, actually, is I said I can I can do better than this O L H here, um, and. Um, 
the, um, the reason I can do better than OLH is precisely that um, I know, well, for one thing, I wrote up those two components so, yeah, here. Um, so there are elements of the orthogonal group which interchange these two components. Um, but I've already killed off, I've already told you how to get rid of those. So th there's o uh, so one thing is that we're only ever going to see things in O tilde. This just comes out of the orthogonal, of, of the fact that we want some geometry in the picture. And then there's also um, a, an, there's another invariant which tells you whether you've interchanged these two components. So you're actually going to get, so, um, we can replace um, OLH by, so, well, something a bit smaller anyway, um, O tilde plus LH, uh, well, almost. Um, Um, so something much better anyway. Well, rather small. I mean, this is, these, are rel these are finite index subgroups. And this plus is the thing that tells you that you're not interchanging the two components. Um, and so I can tell you what that is straight away. Um, you, um, uh, over the reals, you can, you can always write these things. You, always, you can always write, um, as a, write everything as a product of reflections, and it's a question of whether it's reflections in plus one or minus one, uh, sorry, in, in, think, in uh, vectors of positive or negative norm. You score plus one for a reflection in positive norm, and you count the parity. This gives you a, an invariant called the spinner norm, and it's the kernel of that. Um, I say, well, almost. I'll come back to that. Actually, it's not quite as good as that. Um, okay. Uh, well, for one thing, for K three surfaces, the, um, you, the the lattice is um, unimodular, so that discriminant group is trivial. So, uh, so the, the, this plus is still there, but there's no difference between O and O tilde. So I'm precisely writing up what the extra things are that you have to be careful of. Uh, but yes, I mean, it should strongly remind you of what happens for the moduli of K3 surfaces. OK. So well, almost. I mean, actually, you don't quite get tilde here. What you get is, um, um, so maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll say this now. Uh, what you get is you get a, um, so I want to look at a, um, uh, the, the group you get by looking at um, monodromy from, coming from the moduli, and actually the things of geometric origin. And so this is what Markman did. Um, and he told us what that group is in most cases. And I think he worked it out in detail in the K3N case. So one of the things that I think I have to do, and I believe I've done it, is check that the position for complex, uh, for the, for the um, generalized commas isn't really different. Um, so what we, can re what we really want. Um, is Markman's group, which is called mon2 of x, um, um, i.e. the image of monodromy. Um, and so that's actually, um, That can be a little bit bigger than O tilde plus, which is a nuisance. Um, I think the position is that it's um, uh, that it contains O tilde plus as a subgroup of index two. Sometimes, um, 
So, um, um, I think that's one, if I remember rightly, that's one of the cases. So, um, my, my recollection is that this can be bigger than this thing, and it, um, so we ran into this because we looked at the case of K3-2. And there, you actually do get O tilde plus. Um, if you look at K3-N for larger N, you don't get O tilde plus. You get something with an extra, um, uh, some, something extra in it. So I think that there's something similar for, um, f for the, um, the generalized Kummer case. So possibly for D equals 2, you get something nice, but I'm not really that interested in D equal to two. Um, I propose really to ignore this for the moment. OK. So yeah, I've got this about right. Um, so so one thing you want to know is what polarizations there are. I told you to fix the degree. Um, but so here's another difference between what happens in all of these cases and in the K3 case. In the K3 case, if I tell you the degree, um, in other words, if I tell you the, 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 the length of H, then I've told you what orbit it's in under the orthogonal group. That's not true in general. In general, there can be different orbits of vectors of the same, of vectors of the same length. Um, and uh, so this already happens for K3-2, where there are, uh, depending on the, whether the D is, is it 3 mod 4 or not, there can be more than one orbit. Um, so in general, um, there is more than one orbit of um, H of fixed D. And so we analyzed this in detail in the case of K3N. Um, and the analysis for K3N also works for the generalized comma. And the reason why is that the only difference, apart from the slightly different numbers appearing, is that in the K3N case, you have these two copies of E8. Um, but they're unimodular. They don't do any harm for anything. They just sit there. They play no part in this analysis at all. So again, so there is for any D. Um, a split type polarization. And so that's if LH is 2U plus and then minus 2 N plus 1, N plus 1, um, and then minus 2d. Um, and uh, so what you will usually, so what I'm going to do, remember what this is, this is the orthogonal complement of H. So um, what you will usually, and, and so just knowing I've got this lattice, I've got a vector in it of some fixed length. I want to know what its orthogonal complement looks like as a, as a lattice. That's not determined purely by the length of h, but it is determined by, the or by its orbit. So there are two possibilities. One of them is the one that I've just written up, and the other one, you have 2u, and then you have some ir something irreducible here, something with some off-diagonal off -diagonal entries. That only happens if d is, I forget, is it 1 mod, one mod 4 or 3 mod 4, whichever it is. Um, so it's like it refers to the it, identifier that it's Exactly, yes. The 2u is just always there. Um, so, 
uh, that, so there is a non-split case as well, um, which I'm not going to say anything about at the moment, but it's a nat you, know, you could ask all the same questions. Um, but we've done some calculations for this one. Maybe non-split is more interesting. As I say, you have this, you have this thing also for the K3N. Um, I've said this once already. You have this also for the K3N case. And when we have actually seen polarized deformations of K3N in nature, they've tended to come not with this kind of polarization, but with the other kind. So I don't know why that is. But anyway. Right. So what I would like to do is to get at the sort of results that we have for the modular of K3N um, for this case. So the thing that I know how to do um, is to prove general type results for moduli spaces like this. Um, so I'm going to say very briefly how we remind you very briefly what we did to get those and why it doesn't work so well now. And then what I'm going to do instead. So, five. Um, so, for um, K3 and for K3N, um, we have general type results. And the way you get those is this. You write down, you take, what you do is you write down suitable modular forms for the group you're interested in, which in that case is O tilde plus. The modular forms are almost, there, there are lots of them, and they are very close to being pluricanonical forms on the quotient. That's good enough because we have a map from the moduli spaces we're interested in, any components of them, to the quotient of the period domain by the discrete group. So if I can prove that that quotient is of general type, I've shown that the components of the moduli space are of general type. So we write down these modular forms, and then we choose ones. So there are, two, there are three, uh, three things that could prevent a modular form from giving me a pluricanonical form. One is it could blow up at infinity, where, the, where the, um, it could have poles at the cusps. So these are only quasi-projective moduli spaces, so I have to compactify them somehow by adding some stuff at infinity. And when I do that, I could get some, I could get some poles there. Um, one is, and the rest comes from the fact that these, uh, these groups are not torsion-free. So you can have branch divisors, and then you will get poles at the branch divisors, potentially. And so you need to worry about that. Um, and then you can also have singularities, where you have um, loci of higher co-dimension, where there's a non-trivial isotropic group. And then you have to worry about whether those singularities impose it in a junction conditions or not. In other words, whether the singularities are canonical. Though um, Gabi mentioned um, Katharina Ludwig's result um, about the um, moduli of um, spin curves on this. And I think the position there, if I'm right, is that some of the singularities are not canonical, but collectively they still don't impose any. Even for MG. Um, so there, there, are the, the, there can be singularities which would, in principle, be capable, of, which, which locally impose some conditions. Um, but any global 
uh, anything global happens to satisfy those conditions, so you don't have to worry about it after all. Well, you've finished worrying about it once you've found that out. Okay. Um, so, choose um, modular forms vanishing to high order at infinity. So they're cusp forms, but they're cusp forms with a very high vanishing order at infinity. Um, and along the branch divisors of the quotient. Right over tilde plus, although that's not quite the right thing. Um, and then um, the singularities are canonical, i.e. impose no conditions on a junction. So you can take a resolution of singularities and differential forms will extend happily across them. Okay. Right. So, for, um, so now I get to tell you what goes wrong uh, when you try and look at the, um, at the case of um, generalized commas. Um, so, well, they, they, they all do, uh, but um, some of them go... Um, some of them go wrong more than others. So, for generalized commas, this won't work. So, um, this bit, things vanishing to high order at the cusps, that I think we can still do. And I'll come to that in a moment. So the second one, the vanishing along the branch divisors, the way we got that um, was to look at the um, quasi-pullback of the Borchardt's form. Um, so the Borchardt's form is an amazing modular object. And it's constructed um, by the Borchardt's multiplicative lift, which means that what you, you get it as, a, as an infinite product. So you can read off its divisor straight away. You know an awful lot about it, and then you essentially restrict to those divisors and take out the denominator, um, and you get a, you, you can, in those cases, you can get modular forms. But if you try and do that here, you, because, um, well, the weight of the mod, I want modular forms vanishing to very high order at infinity. The way I'm going to do that is to take a modular form of, a cusp form of low weight, and take a high power of it and then some more stuff. By low weight, I mean weight less than the dimension, but the weight of the Borchardt's form is 12, and the dimension here is 4, so I'm sunk. Okay. Okay. So here, um, the dimension is 4. Um, so um, the first the Borchardt's form doesn't help. So I don't have to tell you what it is then in, in detail. And secondly, this statement that the singularities are canonical, that's true as long as the dimension is at least 9, uh, but 4 is less than 9. So um, there can be bad singularities. So what I'm saying is, well, we can do dimension 19, but we can't do dimension 4. On the other hand, we have done quite a lot in dimension 3. Because dimension 3, 
Um, O23 is basically SP is basically SP2 up to a double cover. And so the orthogonal moduli spaces uh, with signature 2, 3, those are Siegel modular threefolds. Moduli spaces of abelian surfaces with maybe sunny polarizations and level structures. And there is a lot of literature about general type results and the geometry of um, moduli spaces of abelian surfaces. And of course, you would kind of expect that to come in here because after all, these are closely related to abelian surfaces to start with. So, so let's see what we can learn in five minutes from moduli of abelian surfaces. So what I'm going to do is write up. Um, oh, I will write up one other theorem. Um, so, um, so we can do f so. Um, so theorem. Um, if you look at A P, um, so that's the moduli. Of, I've got about five minutes. Yes. Yes. Um, the moduli of abelian surfaces um, with 1p polarization. p here is a prime for simplicity. Um, this is of general type. Um, okay, let me write it. The, the, unless P divides the order of the monster. I get an email from, so this is, this is, this version of it is Erdenberger, um, about 2003, and every couple of years I get a, an email from John Mackay asking me whether I know why yet, uh, why it's exactly these numbers. Well, we sort of do. Um, the, um, so what you have to do um, is you want a supply of modular forms with some good properties. I want the modular forms to vanish to high order at infinity. The way you do that is you get a cusp form of weight 2 in this case, we're in dimension 3. So I want cusp form of weight 2. I take, um, if I want a, a modular form of weight n, what I do, or let's say weight 3n to simplify matters, I'll take the nth power of that weight 2 cusp form and then some other form of weight n. And that's a modular form of weight 3n, which is guaranteed to vanish at infinity to order n, which is good enough to allow me to forget about what happens at infinity. But to make that work, I need a cusp form of weight less than the dimension. And um, you construct these by, um, by uh, calling your favorite modular forms expert, which in my case is Kritzenko, and asking him to lift a Jacobi form for you. Um, so the Jacobi forms are essentially the residues that these forms would have at um, infinity. They're essentially what happens at the boundary of the moduli space. Um, so it all works beautifully, except that you need a Jacobi form to lift. And so you then need dimension formulae for the spaces of Jacobi forms, which you get from the book of Eichler and Zagier. Um, and um, then the, in those dimension formulae, there's a condition about uh, the value of p mod 12, or the, in, of, of, of what turns out to be p mod 12. And it gives these funny small numbers up to the last one that doesn't work is 71. Um, and it turns out that these ones are just precisely the primes that divide the order of the monster, which is a sort of well-known thing in, in number theory. Um, and we got some sort of connection between these two. I don't really, I don't really know whether this is sort of true. Well, I mean, um, oh, I'm sorry. OK. Um, no, I'm not saying what happens at first small p.
Um, so, no, it is not a complete result. Um, so, the, well, it's not completely a funny way of stating a theorem because the reason why the, 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 the reason why the dimension formulae for Jacobi forms is the way it is uh, does have something to do with the existence of some theta series which are connected with representations of the monster somehow. But I think that this is not completely, but it certainly isn't understood by me. Um, but I think that there is some sort of, I mean, there, I don't, this does seem to be really what it should be. Um, the point is that we, we need um, forms, Jacobi forms in this case, to lift. So in this case that we're interested in, well, we can try and do the same sort of thing. And this does actually seem to be all right. I mean, um, I've, got, I've, I've only ever tried actually to construct um, forms of, uh, of weight two this way. Weight three would also do. Um, so I haven't tried that yet. Um, but um, it is sort of reasonably clear what one should be trying to lift. And the procedure is it's not really very different from what one does in, um, uh, in the, um, uh, the three-dimensional case. In fact, we'd, we've, we'd, we've done this for other cases as well. Um, so th that part isn't too bad. Um, except that you do have to have some dimension formulae, and I don't know quite what the dimension formulae are. Um, so, what else? Um, we have calculated. So, yes, we have actually done something. Well, we, Matthew, has calculated um, the, um, the bad singularities. It's not that awful because the, um, the thing that does the computation that says you don't get anything bad in dimension 9 um, also tells you what's causing the trouble in small dimension. And they're, they're very small torsion. I mean, it's, essentially, you need only worry about 3 torsion and 5 torsion. Um, everything else is going to be harmless. There isn't any 5 torsion as it happens. So it's only 3 torsion you need to worry about. And... Um, uh, then half the time it comes out to be so there are, I mean the singularities are going to be something like locally they're going to look section of them is going to look like either the cone or the twisted cubic, uh, which is bad, or um, an A2 singularity, which is good. So half the time it comes out to be an A2 singularity anyway. Um, so we we don't we know what these are, we know how many of them there are, we know exactly what they are, we know how to resolve them. So they do impose some conditions, and I think they genuinely do. But um, there are a couple of methods of coping with that. Uh, one is simply to count the conditions and wait until you have enough modular forms to swamp them. And the other is actually to force it, because um, if you've still got this weight n form, you could break that up and make that be some, you could make your form vanish a little. They, they do, these sing the bad singularities happen at infinity. They happen at the cusps. So the forms are vanishing there to begin with. And if you can make them vanish a little bit more, um, then they will extend after you do take the resolution. So we've done this one. And then for the branching, well, that's, again, not too awful because you, um, the branch divisors are, um, well, they'll be similar things to this, but in a dimension lower. So that's Eagle modular threefolds. We kind of know about them. Um, there's one big branch divisor, which is just got by interchanging the two copies of U. And then there are some other components. Now, experience from this case tells us that although there are other branch divisors, they're negligible in practice. That's to say that the obstructions that they give you are very small compared with the obstructions coming from the, the sort of main component. Um, Therefore, what we've done so far is to pretend that they're not there. So at some point, we're going to have to do a calculation and check that, no, really, the obstructions are small. Um, so um, I'll just write that and then stop. OK, so there's one big branch divisor. And that's OK. Uh, well, by it's OK, I mean I know what to do. 
uh, I know how to calculate that obstruction and others um, probably negligible. So I think with, you know, we're armed with this equipment um, and in particular these calculations which are quite new um, we should be able to work something out. So I did a back of an envelope calculation um, for d equals 2 um, which isn't really what I'm interested in. Actually, I don't really want to fix D and increase N. I want to fix N and increase D. But um, I did a back of an envelope calculation, and on the back of my envelope, I got general type for N, sort of a couple of hundred, which is not really very good. But I didn't try to do it particularly efficiently. I'm not really willing to write it on the board and have it um, permanently on the internet in, uh, in writing, because it really was a back of an envelope calculation. But what I'm saying is, if we remember what we did for a bit, we can do dimension 3, we can do dimension 19, surely we can do dimension 4, can't we, if we can do both of those. Okay. It's the period domain and therefore any component of the modular space. I don't know at all whether there are lots of components. So, um, again, uh, we were talking about this earlier. Apostolov has examples where there are many, where, where there are different components. But these, again, are all in the K3, the K3N case. No idea what's going on here. So one of the things I'm hoping to do is to get people thinking about this case. Or perhaps stop people thinking about them by telling them that one of my students is thinking about them. <laughs> 